and just shapes and molds us, Father God. And I thank you for the word of God. I thank you that it enters into our hearts and it stays. And I thank you that we keep it. And those are the thoughts that we keep captive, Father God, and keeping our mind and keeping our in our hearts, Father God. And I thank you that that those those thoughts of evil and those thoughts that are things that we don't need to be dwelling on. I thank you that you give us the strength to say no and to and to push those thoughts out of our mind, Father God, and to and to and to live a holy life, Father God, and to to live a life without torment and live a life of peace, Father God. And I thank you for that in the name of Jesus. And I thank you for the Holy Spirit right now, Father God. I thank you for him coming into this place and just and, uh, and, and, and changing us, Father God, and, and leaving us changed, Father God. And I thank you for that right now. I thank you for the refreshment. I thank you for a refreshment of your Holy Spirit, Father God. And I thank you right now that we leave here to go out into the week and, and face any battle that we might, might, might have, a, have to face this week, Father God. I thank you for that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lift his name. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. We worship you. change anything. Hallelujah. Through us. Amen. But he's also the God of the city. Hallelujah. You're the God of this city. You're the King of these people. You're the Lord 
Lord of this nation You are You're the light in this darkness You're the hope to the hopeless You're the peace to the restless You are There's no reason you should be fretting. There's no reason you should be worrying. 
no matter who's who's in charge because we know who ultimately is in charge amen amen hallelujah 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 thank you god thank you lord and without him it would be nothing amen amen hallelujah without him I could do nothing And without Him I'd surely fail And without Him I would be drifting Like a ship the sail without him I would be dying and without him oh I'd feel enslaved and without Life would be worthless But with Jesus Oh, thank God I'm saved Jesus Oh, Jesus Turn him away, oh Jesus, my sweet Jesus. Without him, how lost I would be.
Then. We're on now. Praise God. Good to have everybody this morning. We're so glad to see you. Uh, don't forget, uh, as soon as church is over, we're, uh, we're heading over to, the, to Gibson Park, and we're having our summer cookout. And um, if you brought clothes, go ahead and change here. You got, we got the dressing rooms over here. You can go change clothes so you don't have to go home. Um, it's not going to be as hot as we thought it was going to be because it's going to be cloudy. Everybody say glory be to God. <laughs> so the clouds are a good thing. Amen. Hallelujah. Rain's not coming in until after we're done. But um, it does give us a break from the sun, um, which is nice. I mean, you know, uh, even 85 and, and no sun and 85 and sun are two different things. If you don't believe me, I got a place where you can work this, this coming summer down in Eastern Carolina called a tobacco field. And uh, you go prime some tobacco. Testing one, two. TV's loud. Ah, well, they need to turn the TV down. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. Um, so anyway, have the, we have um, a nice day for, for the cookout. Amen? We won't have all that heat, praise God. Uh, anybody not know where Gibson Park is? Everybody knows where it is? Gibson Park is between Tarrant and Belk on Wendover. There's a wooden sign out front. It's got a rifle on it like a carved, painted rifle, uh, like a Revolutionary War era type thing, okay? Now that's out there. Glory to God. Huh? Well, it depends on which way you're going. It's between, it's between the two, okay? Yep. Yep, before Belt, that's right. After Terry. On, uh, going that way on the left. Yep. Windover. Windover. Yes, Windover. So if you were leave, leave here, go out of, the, uh, out of the community center, turn left. Go to Wendover, turn left. When you pass Tarrant, or Tarrant, which is, you know, it's a T road, comes in from the, the right. Right after that, on the left, you'll see a, the sign over there off the road. Okay. The uh, west fork of the Deep River, um, or the east fork of the Deep River runs through the, the Deep River, uh, runs under that bridge, just a little real shallow. Right after that, it's not a bridge, it's, just, it's a culvert. So you, you cross right over, but you can see the little stringy looking thing down there. Right after that, it's on the left, okay? And uh, we're in shelter number one. You can see Jeff up there cooking. He's already gone. He's going to cook, get started. So, hallelujah. So we're not going to be getting there and waiting to 3 o'clock to eat. Yeah. You'll be able to go in and probably grab a dog right off the bat. Right off the bat. Hallelujah. Amen? So that is it's, it's afternoon. And we'll go until everybody gets tired of being there and they go home, then we'll just pack up and leave. All right? Hallelujah. We've got about 120 hot dogs, 80 hamburgers, um, you know, so... I think we'll have enough. Should have enough. Amen. Uh, don't forget Wednesday night midweek service, teaching on uh, the priorities of life. This last, we should finish this week with the, your uh, your um, fifth priority of life, your job. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. All right, it's time to receive our Sunday morning offering. If you need an offering envelope, you can raise your hand. Otherwise, you can uh, go ahead and give electronically or get your checks ready. Glory to God. The first is Wednesday. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And um, everybody say glory. glory. Amen. Praise God. Uh, Shanda. All right, everybody ready to give? All right, Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you the people are blessed according to the word of God. Thank you that heaven's windows are open unto them, and they pour out blessings we don't have room enough to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, uh, go ahead and receive that into the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. And I don't think there's any other announcements. Uh, if you were here yesterday, thank you for helping us out with Vacation Bible School. That was It went great, an all-day Vacation Bible School, and the kids were blessed, and we had a good time, and uh, we were just uh, thankful. You know, we, um, we ended up with a lot more kids than we thought we were going to have, which was a blessing. You, know, you hate to do all that work, and then you, know, three, you would do it for three kids, but you're, you're glad you got more than three kids to be able to minister to, and uh, uh, a lot of fun took place yesterday. <clears throat> and since um, nobody was using this room yesterday, we went ahead and set up. Uh, we got the van, brought the stuff over, we set up. Hallelujah, which made this morning like a little bit nicer. Amen? Amen. 
And if we can ask, maybe ask him to turn the TV down to open the doors. It's, it's kind of echoing because nothing can get out. Yeah, it's getting bad on here. We need to get those doors open. All right. Children's Church Preschool, you guys are dismissed. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to get that. Just ask him to turn the TV down out there and let us open our doors because the, the echo in. Yeah. With the doors up, some of the sound gets out of here and doesn't echo so bad. Hallelujah. Boy, I mean, I can hear it myself. It's bouncing back on me. Okay. Hallelujah. All righty. Praise the Lord. Go ahead and get your Bibles out. Hallelujah. We're teaching on, uh, we're teaching on the love of God, and um, we're going to uh, pick up today, if you'll go to John's Gospel, the 13th chapter. This is where we're going to start today. Praise God. Um, we we'll just kind of lay this out. This is uh, Jesus uh, right before uh, Judas betrays him, and then we, we go into uh, a, a very popular section of the Bible, and it's particularly in the Gospels, uh, starting here in John 13, 1. It says, Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart uh, out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil having put now, or, or already put into, uh, the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. And Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, and that he was come from God and went to God. He riseth from supper and laid aside his garments, and took a towel and girded himself, and after that he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. And Jesus answered, I mean, and then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? And Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do, uh, what I do thou knowest, or don't you don't understand now. Not now. So in other words, right now, Peter, you don't understand what I'm doing. Okay? Uh, but thou shalt know hereafter, or understand hereafter. Peter saith, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. And Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt uh, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said, He that is washed needeth not save uh, to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and ye are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him. Therefore he said, Ye are not all clean. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments, he was set down again, and he said unto them, Know ye what I have done unto you? Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye ought, also, ye ought to wash one another's feet. Ye also ought to wash one another's feet. Now, I grew up Pentecostal. One of our doctors of the church was a foot washing. Even in our, in our manual for the, for the, the domination, we had the, how, to, how, how to conduct a foot washing. Yeah. Yes, sir. Take off them shoes to get in them smelly feet. Hallelujah. Yeah. I mean, you know. Now, you understand the reason they did, they washed the feet in the day was they walked in, in sandals on dirt roads and stuff. You'd come into the house, your feet were filthy. Okay? And so, you know, it was, it was a um, normal thing to have someone wash the feet of the, uh, of the guest when they came into the house. Okay? It was a lowly, it was a very lowly, um, humbling experience to wash somebody else's feet. It still is. I know some of y'all think, well, we, yeah, we, you saw those bases out there, didn't you? And the towels this morning? It might have surprised you to do a foot washing one day. That's right. Yeah. Hallelujah. Some of you will be thinking, I'm going to make sure my feet are clean from now on. Got no crusty on them when I come to church. <laughs> Pastor Egg will do a foot washing. Hallelujah. Now, and, and the reason we do it, because Jesus said you ought to do that. And, but the, the purpose of it, you know, in that day was to get them clean. But it was still a humbling thing. So that's when Jesus came to Peter. Peter said, no, no, you can't wash my feet. You're the master. But Jesus was demonstrating the heart of the servant to his disciples, that even as the master, he was it above serving. Now, remember, Jesus said something. You, you, uh, you uh, hot shot preachers 
but all your demands for ministry ought to listen to a little bit about Jesus. For the Son of Man came not to be ministered to, but to minister. That, that word can be translated serve. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to, but to serve. We got so many preachers right now, so big dog and so whatever, but, you know, they got people who have to walk around and, and hold their coat for them, you know, because they held the coats of, of Paul and those guys uh, when they were stoning folk. Okay? That's not a good position to have. Official stone thrower hold, coat holder. Okay? You know, we got, we, we got our armor bearer. We got people running around. We, and these, these we ministers can get so big-headed and cocky, let's just put it what it is, about who we are, we forget what our job is. We're the servants. Well, I've been talking, listen, it's gone so far, I had someone tell me about a church where the women in the church would have sex with the pastor because they need to take care of his needs. Everybody say, devils. They need some devils cast out in that church, starting in the pulpit. Hello. They're so, so ingrained in, in them that you've got to take care of the pastor. Listen, let me say, that ain't your job. Hello. If you're married, it's your spouse's job. If you ain't married, it ain't nobody's job. Hello. Are you here? You go home. It's not your job to, you know, to just worship and follow and, 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 and bow down at the pastor because he's the man of God. I'm sorry. He is sent. The Bible says he's worthy of honor, worthy of double honor, especially those that labor. And honor and, and, and man worship are two different things. Respecting the position because it's going to minister to you is one thing. Doing crazy stuff. You know, and, and, and serving him like you're, you know, you're his, his, his personal servant can get overboard. And ministers should be able to stop and get back what they are serving the people. Paul said, I'm willing to spend and be spent for the sake of the gospel. Amen. Don't talk to me. I'm the man of God. I know they do. We had that whole, that whole season in our churches that you couldn't talk to the preacher before or after church because he was open to the spirits. His spirit was open. And, you know, uh, you know he's, he's, the anointing can't be messed with. Jesus sat right down in the middle of the ministered. He'd sit down and eat with the publicans and sinners and then preach. And his anointing didn't bother his anointing any. Hello? Are you here? I mean, he's in the crowd, people touching him, slapping on him, trying to get find out stuff, and some woman comes up and gets healed supernaturally because didn't mess with the anointing on him. I think we should follow his example. Now, I understand not being silly and stupid and callous and stuff when you're ministering and that kind of thing, you know, being being overboard. But we we got we got you remember Brother Bill? We had to guard. We put uh, we put we put teams outside the door so nobody could get near the pastor before he preached because can't mess with the anointing. The anointing is stronger than somebody asking you a stupid question. <laughs> if it's not, it's not the anointing. The Holy Ghost can handle dumb questions before church service. Hello. Y'all hear you going home. Sorry. That was not in my notes. Actually, I don't even have any notes. I really don't this morning. Why bring the what you're not going to use? <laughs> Makes me feel better to have them, but, you know. Listen to this next verse. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Now, it's not the foot washing that he's telling you that you should have done. It's the attitude of the servant the humbling of yourself before those who others would consider your lesser. Now, Jesus didn't. Remember, he said, I've called you friends. Okay? Not just servants. You're my friends. You know, my endeared ones. Amen? So he said, he says, I've given you an example. 
I've washed your feet. I've humbled myself. I've lowered myself in the sight of men in society. And I've washed your feet. This is the example. Become the servant. Become the servant. Can somebody say amen? amen. And, if it's, if, and if it's good enough for the master, it's good enough for me. Amen. 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 Like that woman said one time, somebody was preaching and kept saying, well, the Greek says this and the Greek says that. And she finally got, got upset and came up to the preacher at the church and looked at him and said, I just want you to know one thing. If the King James was good enough for the Apostle Paul, it's good enough for me. <laughs> really? Anyway, it's one of them 1611 King James people. That's the only Bible you can read. Okay? Verse 16, Verily, verily, I say unto you, listen to this, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither is he sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, happy are you if you do them. I speak not of you all. I have no whom I have chosen, but that the Scripture may be fulfilled. Um, he that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it come, that when it has come to pass, ye may believe that I am he. And he's telling him, somebody's going to betray me, and when it happens, you're, I'm, I'm, I'm prophesying. I'm going to tell you what's going to happen ahead of time. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that receiveth whomsoever I send receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. When Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. I mean, you've know, you got to think, this has got to be heavy on him. He's coming to the earth. He's come to bring the heart of the Father to humanity, to reveal God to people. Has a team of people that's traveled with him for three, going almost three and a half years. They, they've walked together. They've, they've slept in, in, in difficult positions that, or situations. They've... <clears throat> They've had to face all kinds of persecution and all kinds of things. And one of them that he has put his heart into, he knows is going to betray him. He knows it. And his heart, he's, he's troubled. He's heavy. And then the disciples looked around one another, doubting of what he, whom he spake. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Now, Jesus loved, you know, John's called the disciple whom Jesus loved. Okay, there, this is a, a phileo love in the sense of brotherly love, camaraderie. Okay, now you've got perverts out there who say that Jesus and John were homosexual because they read this with, with, with pervert eyes. Pervert. Really? <laughs> That's not a song we want to have in our head at the church. <laughs> He can't help it. I'm the one who takes everything people say around the house and sing a song to it. It just gets passed on, you know what I'm saying? And um, no, this is phileo. This is the love where there's a camaraderie, there's a closeness, a brotherly love. Like the love covenant between Jonathan and David. They weren't, they weren't uh, partners. They were close friends. See, we can't, even, we can't even talk about love anymore without perversion having entered in. You can't talk about godly love or, or friendship love without be, people being perverted in their thinking. And you've got you to spend 10 minutes explaining it so people understand what, what you're talking about there. Because the devil's just sitting on people's head, ears, shoulders, whispering stupid stuff in their ears. And they're stupid and listening. Okay? All right. Um, so the, he, he's, he's over there. He's leaning against Jesus. You know, they're, they're close. And, and, they're, and, they're, and Simon Peter, therefore, beckoned to him. That he should ask him. You know, Peter's over there like, John, 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 what are you doing with this? That's what he's doing. He beckons to him to find out who he spake of. So, you know, old Peter's a cut the ear off guy. You know, he's the, he's the put the foot in the mouth, you know, uh, uh, do and ask questions later kind of guy. He's the Rocky of the team. You know, he's called the Rock. I mean, you know, the, the, the Petra, Petros, okay, the stone. Um, and Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him that he should ask him who it was. And he then lying on Jesus' breast said unto him, Lord, who is it? And he said, who is, he is who I give a sop or a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And after that, after the sop, Satan entered into him. Remember we read earlier that Satan had already put it into his heart to betray Jesus. And at this point, he opens up and is possessed. He becomes possessed. Right? And Jesus said, Thou thou doest, do quickly. 
Now, no man at the table knew for what intent he spake this unto him. For some thought of, of them thought uh, that Judas had a bag and that Jesus had said unto him, buy those things we have need of against the feast or that he should give something to the poor. He then received the sot, went immediately out, and it was night. And he went out and immediately betrayed him. Okay? And therefore, when he has gone out, Jesus said, now... Now remember, Jesus already knew about this trap. starts out saying he knew it was the time for him to return to the Father. So we're sitting at this meal. Y'all know what we call this meal, don't you? It's the Last Supper. Okay? Now it was the last one before we went to the cross, but you know, they, had, they had some afterwards. But we, we, we call it the Last Supper, and it's just, you know, that's kind of one of those things we kind of picked up. The Bible don't call it the Last Supper. It's just what we call it. Okay? It's Passover. And they were eating the Passover meal. Okay? And uh, Jesus said, now is the Son of Man glorified. And God is glorified in him. And if God be glorified in him, God shall also be glorified in himself and shall straightway glorify him. Little children, yet a little while I am with you, and ye shall seek me. And as I said unto the Jews, whether I go, ye cannot come. So now I say unto you. Now, let's stop. Here's the stage. Jesus knows it's time to be offered up. Jesus knows the end of this earthly ministry is coming to a close, and the purpose of his coming is about to take place. Okay? All these things. He knows the one that, that's going to betray him has gone out to betray him. It's happening. It's all in motion. He has his, he has his 11 disciples there. You know, at least 11, because Judas was one of the 12, and he went out. There could have been others. Okay? You know, they, they always, anybody ever seen, seen Da Vinci's The Last Supper, the painting of The Last Supper? Okay, we've seen it in person. Okay, it's cool, right? It's cool. Been restored a bunch because, you know, that, 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 you know, 2,000 years of fading and stuff. It actually survived the bombing. Yeah. Um, so anyway, he, you know what they, they say, the little joke he is, what did Jesus say at the table? They all, everybody get on this side so we can take a picture. Because they're all on the other side of the table eating it with dinnerware. They're sitting in the floor, guys, probably eating with their hands. That's probably not a real depiction of it, but, you know, when it was painted, that's, that was, you know, a dinner. But Jesus is sitting here. Here he is. He knows, honestly, this may be one of the last conversations he has with the group before he goes to the cross. He knows it. The midnight hour is at hand. Jesus has gone out. To, to go betray him. And Jesus has been teaching them for three years, three and a half years. They've watched him do the miracles. They've watched him walk on water. They've watched him calm the storms. They've watched him cast out devils. They've watched him raise the dead. They've even gone out with his name and done those things themselves by the authority and power he gave them. But now he's heavy. He's waited. We know that when he goes into the Garden of Gethsemane, he prays with such stress that he begins to uh, uh, have drops of blood. And what they scientifically they uh, studied that under great stress, the, the uh, capillaries in the skin and the forehead can burst and mix in the sweat and come out as blood. That was a stress of the moment of care about what was about to happen. And what does Jesus do in this moment? Whether I go, you cannot come. So now I say unto you. He's got a word. He's got a, he's got a message for them. He's got something to say in this last time. That his, this, this is the most important thing on his mind to say to them. A new commandment I give unto you that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this all men shall know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one for another. Now hold your place here, and let's run over real quick to uh, Matthew's gospel in the uh, 22nd chapter, 33rd verse. And when the multitude heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. You now, Jesus had doctrine. Okay? Teachings, doctrine. But when the Pharisees had heard he had put the Sadducees aside, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, 
ask him a question, tempting or testing him, and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? He didn't say which is the only commandment. He said which is the great commandment. One of the biggest mistakes we make now in Bible interpretation of of these, this statement and some of the things we're saying right now is that, that this is the only commandment. He just said, which is the great? Yeah. Let me see, and, and I'll prove it to you because Jesus clarifies this. And Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and all thy mind. Listen, this is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Listen to what he says in the next verse. On these, loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself, hang all the law and the prophets. Think not that I came to do away with the law. I came to fulfill it. Remember? See, we got people running around saying, I don't have to, you know, I can do whatever I want to do, and it don't matter because I, I'm, in, I'm under the law of love. I'm under grace. It doesn't, no, that's not what Jesus said. Jesus qualified how the law was to work. God's moral code is God's moral code is God's moral code. It's still his moral code. It just, you know, you can't just throw it away because he loves you. Jesus said, because they asked that, that to, to the, the people of God, the first commandment, is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength, your neighbor as yourself, because all the law and the prophets hang on that. What does he mean? If you love your neighbor, you won't commit adultery with his wife. You won't be doing couch time with the neighbor's wife if you love him. Are you here? I know I get a little crass sometimes, but you know, you got to talk what people understand. I mean, you got idiots out there saying that they're doing wife swapping and husband swapping parties because they're going to lead them to the Lord because the best way to show people you love them is to have sex with them. You're an old 70s LSD person. You're tripping still. You dropped acid back in the 60s and 70s, and you're having flashbacks. you got to be. Because there ain't no way in your, in your right mind you could come up with it. The, way, the best way to show the love of God is to go out and commit adultery with them. When the Bible prohibits it, God prohibits it. If you love your neighbor, you won't um, be envious of his possessions or her possessions. Amen? If you love your neighbor, you won't do them harm. So all the commands of God about don't do this and don't do that, hang. Now remember, they had to do it as a ritualistic can't do or they get in trouble. Simply by sheer, I'm going to pay a price if I do it. The fear of paying the price. Jesus is trying to make it clear that because you love God and you love your neighbor as yourself, that you won't do these things. It comes, you know, you're coming from a different perspective. Your view of this changes to not doing it because you're going to get in trouble, but not doing it because you love them. And you love God. Now let's run back over here to John. Because Jesus now even takes this and moves it into a different arena. Because it's no longer just love God, love your neighbor. A new commandment. I give unto you that you love one another. Wait, here it is. Here's the qualifier. As I have loved you. Oh, now that's a whole different thing. It's not just that we're loving God and we're loving our neighbor and we're trying to figure out some way to get through it. I have an example to follow. The way that Jesus loved me is how I am to love the Father and to love others. Amen. That's a whole different arena. It's not I love you because I'm going to get something back out of you. It's not, you know, I love you because I got to. I love you. I don't like you, but I love you. But Jesus now, think of this. After all this, 
knows he's about to leave, tells him, you can't come where I'm going right now because he has to go pay the price for man's sin. They can't come where he's going. No one can do what he's about to do but him. Now, when I get to where else, the, the final destination, you can come there. You find out, and he kind of says that, you know, in, in, later on. But where he's about to go right now, nobody can go but him. He's going to leave them with this word to ingrain upon their thinking. Because so, you can't go where I'm going. I'm telling you this. This is what I got to say to you. I'm giving you a new commandment. They've heard him teach. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. They heard him say that. And maybe you might look at it and say, he's saying the same thing. No, because he, he, he brought a new quality to it. He brought a new emphasis to it. But I've given you an example. My life has been an example for you guys. My life has been the blueprint of how to conduct yourself. It's the schematic of how to function. My life is what you emulate. Not your friend Bozo, who has an opinion about everything. Are you here? Who doesn't know his head from a hole in the ground? That's not your example. Not Whitney Houston and Sister Act. I mean, not Whitney. Uh, Whoopi Goldberg and Sister Act. That's not your example. I love the movie. Don't take me wrong. Love the movie. Think it's think it's great. That's not my example of how to act as a Christian. Hollywood does not teach me how to act like a Christian. The world doesn't teach me because they don't understand love in the first place. Not the agape of God, not the love of God. Their love is tied solely to the flesh and emotion. And you know it, I know it, we all know it, and you watch and know it. You can be in love today and hate their guts tomorrow. Are you here? I'm telling you. You can be, I love you. Then find out they cheated. Lied, 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 lied. You lied to your daddy. It's an old Anna Tam song. All right. Some of y'all don't know that song. Good. And guess what happens the next day after you find out they cheated? You hate them. I mean, yeah, I'm about to put the hawk knife out on them and cut on them. Come on now. You be messing with me like that. I'll cut you. I've had people in the church pull knives on their spouse. Yeah. And thought it was funny. Pull on knives. What? Melanie. You see, Jesus' love did not get based on whether they did everything he liked, whether they gave him all he wanted, whether he, um, you know, people sometimes, they, they wonder about me. They think I'm crazy. Because we've had people do things, leave the church, say things, do things to us, try to hurt us. And I, I can understand where you're coming from because it does hurt. It hurts. I'm telling you, it hurts. I mean, you're not. You, just don't, you don't even have any feeling if it doesn't hurt. Stuff that people have said about us and done to us over the years. But then they're in a need. We don't not go. Because we love them. And my love is not based on what they did or didn't do to or for me. I have an example. The master. Even at the cross, he said, forgive them, for they know not what they do. As they nailed him, and they wagged upon him, they, they lashed upon him with their tongue, and they, they spoke evil against him, and everything else, and he said, forgive them. And I can tell you, it doesn't matter who it was, what they did, or when they left, or how they left, or what they did. If they're in a need, I'm there. I'll be there. They can call me up and say, I need you. I'll be there. 
I don't go, why don't you go to your pastor in your new church that was so great. I don't do that. There's a reason they called. And whatever that reason was, whatever they knew that they, they really believed that we know we know how to get a hold of God or they whatever it is. My heart is not, well, you did this to me, I ain't coming. That doesn't that, that's irrelevant. Why? Because the master is my example. I don't care what seminar I went to and they said, you need, you need to do this and you need to do that. That's not my example. My example is the master. And he told me, because he told the disciples in this hour, a new commandment. Not new in quality, not new as in it doesn't exist. Okay? Kind of the implication here in, in the Greek is it's, an, it's new in quality. And it is. It's new in quality. Because before in the Old Covenant, they were to love the Lord the God with all the heart, soul, and strength and the neighbor as herself. But Jesus moves it up. This love that you're supposed to have, you've seen it in action. And you'll continue to see it in action. Hello? Yes, there is a wrath of God. There is, a, there is judgment of God. There are things out there. I mean, the Apostle Paul had that encounter. Because when Jesus showed up, it was, it, was a, it was a Mr. T moment. Are you here? Fool, get saved or you're going to hell now. So how many, who remembers Mr. T? Some of y'all remember Mr. T. All right. Yeah, I pitied the fool, you know. When Jesus showed up to Paul, it was, it was one of two things. You, you're getting saved, you're going to hell, and it's going to be right now. Why? Because you're kicking against the pricks. You're, you're persecuting my people. Now, my people, will, I will protect my family from your persecution. And Paul, Paul, Paul went, uh, who art thou? Lord, <laughs> uh, you're, I see you're raised from the dead. I confess you as Lord. I'm saved. Wrote about that later, too. Hallelujah. But, but let's, you know, not talking about that right now. We're talking about Jesus talking to his, his inner group. And he, make, he not only says this, that I'm, you're to love one another as I love you. He said, this is how everybody's going to know. This is how people are going to know that you're my disciples. Because you have love one for another. Now, I'm about to step into something that's going to tick people off. Now, you may as well go ahead and get your tick off uh, eliminator ready. All right? One of the problems we have in the church right now is politics. I see such vitriol and such garbage coming out of, out, of the, out of Facebook and social media by Christians that it just ticks me off. I got people that I know from bypass, from my, from my high school days that I'm friends with on Facebook and love them. They're great people. But when they get to talking about politics, I want to slap them. And then I got people who I agree with, I want to slap. It's not a matter whether I agree with you or disagree with you. It's how, what's going on. It is the conversation and the way we are doing things that has made everything toxic. Now, let's just step back one presidency. How many, you know? We saw a bunch of O'Dummer, O'Bummer, uh, Dumocrats with a P. Hello? Um, just on and on and on and on. 44 and not my president and all this kind of stuff. And let me say something. I'm going to be honest with you. There's a lot of policies I disagree with. I do not agree with abortion. I do not agree with homosexuality. Cannot support it. We'll never support it. Don't, I don't care who's in office. I don't care if they're Republican, Democrat, Independent, uh, whatever, right wing, left wing, in the, between the wing, uh, you know, whatever. I can't agree with you. And before, and before who gets this or gets that or who's, who gets what they want in politics, when it comes to the issue of abortion and, and uh, homosexual relationships and marriage, as a Christian, I cannot support those who support that. I cannot to kill the unborn is inhumane, is demonic. It is, de it is devilish. To, to throw in the face of God 
homosexuality as an alternate lifestyle is, is an abomination to God. I will not support those. But I can't get on Facebook and talk about people like they're a bunch of dogs because we have a difference in agreement in political things. Now, we're in this presidency, and what have we got? You know, 45, orange man. Um, you know, tr impeach Trump. We, I mean, it's the same thing. It's just switch sides. The same thing we had during the Obama administration, we now have under the Trump administration. It's just that which, part, which people are saying has switched sides. Under, under Obama, all the Republicans and conservatives were saying horrible things. And now that Trump is in there, all the liberals and Democrats are saying horrible things. And then they get on Facebook and talk about they're going to get their shot on this Sunday. You can't have your shout on on Sunday and slamming the president on Monday. Doesn't matter what administration you're talking about. Because you know what? The Word of God commands you to pray for those in authority. Not try to get them impeached. We have a system that if you don't like and your heart tells you that whoever's in office is the wrong person, we have a system by which that can be taken care of. It's called an election. And you pray and you seek God. And, and, and then you judge things according to the word of God. Who should I vote for? And then go do that. And then after that, you pray about it. You don't sit on Facebook and slam everybody and post Stuff on Facebook that if you go study it, it ain't even true. Hello. Now listen, I know we've got Democrats, Republicans, and Independents in this church. And I love all of you. But stop it. Stop with the mess on Facebook and social media. If you don't like what the president's doing, you don't like what Congress is doing, get on Facebook and say, praying for my leaders. Join me and pray for my leaders. I don't agree with what they're doing. You're not going to change it. They're calling them some name. <coughs> Hello. We got people still fussed about whether Obama was, was a natural born citizen or not. It don't matter. He's out of office. My God. They're saying that Trump's wife was a soft porn star. It don't matter. He's in office. We got anybody dude, trying to compare Michelle and uh, uh, Ivana? They're, it don't, they're two different people. Which one's better? They're not running the country. It doesn't matter. But I feel better if such and such is, that's the problem. We're finding identity in our politics instead of in Christ. We're finding identity, hello, and we let that govern because we've identified, we have a political identity. And because we're letting the politics of our life identify who we are, we let it govern how we treat our neighbor. My example is not Donald Trump. It was not Barack Obama. It was not George H.W. Bush. It was not Bill Clinton. It was not George, George W. then H.W. It's not Ronald Reagan or uh, Jimmy Carter or Richard Nixon or Johnson or Kennedy. That's not my identity. Eisenhower, yeah, guy, guy, Truman. Roosevelt. <laughs> well, I got back to Kennedy, I was, and I only had one more to go before I was born. When I was... <laughs> we as believers, listen, the Word of God says in the book of 2 Chronicles, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and I will Heal their land. But what have we got going on? Jesus said, by this shall all men know you are my disciples, but you have love one for another. And I'm going to tell you something, folks. When people, the world looks at our Facebook post, 
and see you shouting on Sunday and slamming on Monday, they don't see the love of God. And that, can I just say something else? You stop listening to the head of whatever political party you're associated with. They're not, they are not your master. They are not your feeding trough. They are not the one who sets the standard of your life. We are standard setters, not followers. The word of God in us, the master, is our example. Hello? I mean, you know, Sister Lynette Hagen just had a, a long post the, last week about politics and how Facebook has just become so vitriol and so angry. And all, all everybody wants to post is, yeah. it's right now it's all against Trump. I get it. Last time it was all against Obama. Before, before the last election, it was all against Obama for eight years. And I'll be honest, I, like I said, there's a, there's a lot, there is a lot I disagreed with. In particular, the two things, I, and, and I'm going to tell you something. If, um, if Giuliani had gotten elected and was a president, I would disagree with him because he supports both of those things. And I wouldn't have voted for him. So it doesn't matter what party I'm a part of. It is, when I look at the, what people stand for, I can or cannot vote for him. We get more upset over people coming across the borders illegally than we do killing babies in the womb, cutting them up in little pieces and sucking them out. We'll, let, we'll, we'll demand the right for women to walk into a place and for them to go in there with, with scalpels and, 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 a, and a camera and cut the head of that baby off and cut the arms off and cut the legs off and then suck the pieces out and call it the removing of fetal tissue than we are. We get more upset about People coming across the border illegally. And let me say something. There's human trafficking going on. They're bringing people across. That aren't even, they're not even families. They're kidnapped children being brought to sold into the sex slave. And I talked to the Democratic senator from North Carolina during the, when they were still Democrat, Hagan, and she was still the, the senator from North Carolina. I talked to their aide because the kids knew when we went to D.C. and we met with them and talked to them. Charlotte is one of the number one places in America for sex trafficking, human slavery, right out of our state. And they're being brought from other countries into our country and sold. We, 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 buy the, we buy the TV. We buy this. We get mad at everybody else. Instead of getting on our face and calling on God and saying there's a problem. We can help, we can help people from other countries without having to. And you, you all understand. Part of this is just about getting enough people into this other country to have a voting block that will be in power forever. And I'm going to tell you something. If socialism comes, the church will pay. We have kids now, all the millennials are demanding, not all, but the good Lord portion of the millennials are demanding socialism now. They have no idea what they're asking for because we've, we've rewritten history. I've been in the former Soviet countries. I've been there and saw what communism did after 70 years. It emaciated people. They, the God was humanism, not God. The churches were boarded up. State-run preachers, priests were in there running the things. All, all the artifacts were locked away. Jesus wasn't preached. Are you here? I've, I've seen it. We don't want it. We don't want socialism. We don't want communism. Now, back around. We as the church, our Republican people, our Democratic people, our independents, our libertarians, communists, you need, you need the devil cast out of you. You need to get saved. Hello. We have to come back together as believers and stop doing our shout on Sunday and also doing it on Monday. Amen. That we live on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday like we were dancing about on Sunday. That when we are with our brother and sister in Christ, we love one another. We're not doing Facebook bashing. Let me say something else. How many have found out how you, say, you can say things on Facebook or Instagram or social media that you would never say it to a person's face? There is a 
buffer from reality when you do it that way. But the effects are still the same. The fallout is still the same. The damage is still the same. Are you here? You know, I, you probably gonna have to be hard pressed to find political posts on my, my my Facebook. I don't like to make them. I don't make them. Number one, if you have a different view, I cut off myself from the ability to minister to you because you won't hear a thing I got to say. Hello, you won't listen to anything I got to say because it's that bad now. It's so bad now. Hello? You know? Did slavery happen in this country? Duh. Of course it did. Was it evil? Absolutely. Am I, am I living like I'm living because I've got white privilege? Hogwash. My wife grew up in a house that she could see the chickens under the house through the floor. When one, one room had heat. Are you here? Now, I didn't go, but she did. I don't have white privilege. See, and, and you're not down because you're black or African-American or you're Latino or you're Asian. You don't, you're not, not ahead because of that. Well, this country, I don't care what this country does. I don't care what the politics of this country say. You can rise above it no matter what. The Bible tells me and t- tells you you're the head and not the tail above only and not beneath. Blessed coming in and blessed going out. Blessed when you lie down. Blessed when you rise up. It didn't say if only if you have white privilege. <clears throat> and I've watched in our church African-American community people, and I'm using that term just so we can address what we're talking about here, rise out of the projects, rise out of the low-paying jobs, rise out of situations where they shouldn't be able to get ahead according to people's thinking or society or the whatever ceiling that's supposedly keeping them down because they took the Word of God and believed God and started speaking the Word. I watched them rise, and nobody could stop them. Nobody can stop you. Stop listening to the pimps who tell you, and I'm talking about political pimps, who tell you you got to bow at the altar of their, of their um, political party to get what you want in life. I bow at one altar, and you should bow at one altar, the altar of the Lord Jesus Christ, the new birth the, through God, the power of God. That's who I bow to, and to him only do I bow to. And if the people I, I affiliate with go a different direction than God, I go a different direction, different direction than them. I don't go with them. I don't go where they contradict God. I don't care what mama grandmama, great-grandmama, Aunt Louise, or Uncle Leroy says. It don't matter. I follow God. And in the church, when we come together, you're my brother or sister. You're my brother and sister outside, but when we come together, I have, I'm required by example to love you, to show you the love of God. Now, did I step in it deep enough? Well, I don't like what you had to say. Can I say this in love? Tough. Just get over it because it's still true. The, Jesus says something, and I know I'm, next week we're going to pick up and go further than this out of here. Jesus said this interesting. A house divided against itself cannot stand. Now, let me tell you, in the world right now, the, the enemy is trying to divide America by political party and race. I understand the world doesn't follow God. That's just the nature of the world. The sad thing is, is the church has fallen into it. And now the church is being divided by political party and race. Now, I remember when uh, um, the Ancrum first came to our church, the church they had been at, said, you can't be over there, white legs and black legs all running together. 
you over there in that white man's church. Now, I've told you this before. This ain't white. That's white. All right? I ain't white. I ain't white. I'm tan. <laughs> Ethnically Caucasian, okay? I ain't white. I ain't, I'm a honky. You know, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm peach or something. Reddish. With brown freckles. My dad used to say he didn't get a suntan. His freckles just ran together. What does it matter what color the minister is if he's called of God and anointed? It, it doesn't matter. But we got people dividing themselves. This is the white church. This is the black church. I can't find them in the Bible. They didn't have Greek church or Jewish churches. They had a church. Now, Paul recognized three races of men, ethnos in the New Testament, the Jew, the Greek, in the church of God. That meant the line natural lineage of Abraham that had a natural covenant, the Greek, the unsaved, the lost, the heathen, and the church. And the church contained everybody. Jews, Greeks, whatever. It didn't matter. All of them had gotten saved coming there. They were all together. He made a one of a, a one a, a wall, one of twain, that's the difference, the Jews and the Greeks, the, Jew, the Jews, the natural lineage. All those outside of that, well, it didn't matter what race they were, and ethnically, skin color. <clears throat> if you weren't saved, you were you were a Greek. You'd have the Jew, only because of the natural lineage of Abraham, God had made a covenant. He still was set promises to uphold. The unsaved, he, everybody, everybody else, didn't matter where he came from. And then he, God said He made of those two one new man, the church. There's not a white church. There's not a black church. There's not an Asian church. There's a church. Are you here? And we either love God and we love one another, and if we love one another, <clears throat> then we have to demonstrate that love one to another. And if we can't do that, we're in trouble. Why? Because Satan will divide us and Satan will defeat us. Satan will defeat us if we can't get on the same page as believers. Which is mean you're going to have to leave your stinking politics somewhere else. Hello. You can you can have a political opinion and you can you know you can have conversations with people, but stop putting it all over Facebook with all your your arrogance and your anger and your madness and everything else, and be somewhere somebody can come to and talk to you about Jesus. Jeff Walker, a friend of mine from uh, California. Uh, he put out there that he will not. What, what did he say, Jessica? It was really good. Was, uh, did y'all get that? Huh? I will not sacrifice my ability to minister Jesus' love for others at the altar of political dogmatism. Well, I'm right. The other person says they're right. But my number one responsibility is to get Jesus to people. We'll, we'll let him start working on them about what they believe, about who should be in office and that kind of stuff. Amen? But we got to get to them. And they're not going to know we're Christians if we don't have love one for another. Why would the world want our Jesus when we can't get along? Why would the world want to serve the God that we serve and all they see is us slamming each other back and forth on Facebook? And for eight years, every time some meme came along about Obama, people were putting him up. For the last 16 months, every meme that comes across about Trump comes across, people are putting it up. And then everybody starts to defend their president, who they choose. Not my president. 
You might feel that way, but it makes it don't make you so. If you didn't like Obama, he was still your president, whether you liked it or not. If you don't like Trump, he's still your president. And you better be following the command of the, uh, of the word of God to pray for your leaders, not try to get them kicked out of office. You can vote them out, but get off of Facebook and get in your prayer closet. And when you're on Facebook, let people see we love one another. Because the house has to stand together. Now, I've been waiting all summer to say this. I got this in, in May. These things have been stirring up since May. And I had to get the right setting to say it in. And some of you might be mad with me. And I told you tough. Because sometimes you need to be slapped upside the head with a, with a Bible word to get your thinking straightened out. Amen. And you need to tell your friends on the, in private or something. Back channel messaging. There's a thing called messaging. You don't have to put it on Facebook. You can do it in the back. Stop it. You're cutting your ability off to minister to people. Yeah, but you, people get angry, so angry at politics they can't even think straight. Think about what spirit's behind it if you're that angry. Hello? You need to be praying before elections, asking God to intervene, to show himself, to give you direction. And then after it's over, you got to be praying for those who got in office. That God will keep, either keep them from making mistakes, keep them from bringing harm and hurting the church, or remove, remove them from office if they need to be removed. But make it private. Get back to being believers who walk like Jesus walked. <laughs> Tried to get him in a political conversation one day. Is it lawful to pay uh, to, uh, tribute to Caesar or not? He said, give me a coin. He said, whose inscription's on it? They said, Caesar's. He looks at him and goes, then render to Caesar what's Caesar's and the gods what's God's and walked off and they all walked. Because <laughs> they were trying to get him caught up in politics. And he wouldn't let them. He just left him looking dumbfounded. We need to let the people be dumbfounded at our love. Father, we bless the people. We speak your word. We thank you for the Holy Ghost. Thank you for the direction you've given us today. We bless them in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. We love you. Don't forget the park. God bless. We've got to break everything down, get it loaded up before we get out of here now, guys. If you go change clothes, you can change clothes here. And until we see you again, God bless you. Remember this. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Until next time, the Lord bless you in Jesus' name. Love you. God bless you.